Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you for another beautiful day, Lord, for the sunshine. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who has given us everlasting life. Mm -hmm. We pray this morning, Lord, as we come before you and your word is opened up that you would speak to our hearts and our lives, the message you have for each and every one of us. We pray for the worship. We want to honor you. We want to bless you through these songs we sing unto you. And Lord, may our hearts and minds be focused on you this morning. May there be no distractions. But Lord, may we be open to receive those things you have for each of us. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Okay, this morning we're going to read Psalm 54. Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil and cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. This morning, if you would, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1 as we continue our in-depth study of the Gospel of John. And we've been looking at John the Baptist who was ministering on the east side of the Jordan River, just above the Dead Sea in an area called Bethbara or Bethany. And in our last study, we saw how John witnessed to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, about who he is. Uh, one of the problems was the Jewish religious leaders back in Jerusalem, they wanted to figure out what this guy was doing in the middle of the wilderness. Uh, so they sent men out to see what John the Baptist was doing and what the commotion was all about. I don't think they were interested really in changing their lives, but they just wanted to know why this guy had such a big following. Uh, I think they were kind of jealous of him because people were traveling from all over the place to hear this guy. And Matthew chapter 3, verses 4 and 6 give us this indication of how popular he was. It says, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Think about it. I mean, did John the Baptist look like any of the Jewish religious leaders of his day? Obviously not. I mean, he, I always think of John the Baptist as a hippie. You know, the long hair, the big leather belt, you know, the sandals. On, and, well, everyone wore sandals. But you know what I mean. He didn't fit the type of someone who was supposed to be representing God. And yet the Jewish religious leaders were supposed to be the people who were representing God. It was the exact opposite. John the Baptist was doing what God wanted him to do. He was speaking forth the things of God, and the people were interested, and they were coming to hear what he had to say. And it troubled the religious leaders in, in Jerusalem. I mean, you think about it. This guy was not trained at all, right? As I said last week, he didn't go to old rabbi university. No qualifications. And yet he was sent by God. So he was totally qualified. And what's interesting, these religious leaders, all they wanted was information. They didn't want transformation. They wanted information. What are you doing? Who gave you the right to do this? Who are you? And then they were going to report back to the leaders in Jerusalem, the religious leaders. They didn't want to repent of their sins. They didn't want to be changed at all. Why? Because they're holy men of God. That's the way they saw themselves. The Pharisees especially. The Pharisees would walk around, and if you came by, they would tuck their robes in because they didn't want their robes touching you because, you know what, you guys are sinners. And if you touch me, I'm going to be contaminated by you. That's what they thought, and they were totally wrong. So they didn't want to change. That's why John, you know, John didn't pull any punches. He just told it like it was. And in, again, in Matthew 3, verses 7 through 12, this is what he said. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, 
Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now his, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John just lays it out there. Just because you're a descendant of Abraham, it's not going to save you. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. Here was the information for them. But they refused to listen. They refused to apply that to their lives. And that's really true of every single person on this planet. They have the information to be saved, and then it's up to them to receive it. But it's a choice. But John is an interesting guy because he's so popular, right? People are coming from all over to hear him, but he doesn't draw attention to himself. He points the people to the one who is worthy for that attention, and that's Jesus. And in our study, we're moving on to the next day, day two, and the encounter that John the Baptist has with Jesus. I call the study John the Baptist's testimony. And who's he going to testify of? Jesus. It's pretty simple. You know, the problem today is many deny the existence of God or they think you just can't know God or they make up a God out of the imagination of their own heart. Again, this is what they think in spite of the evidence that's out there. Let me share this with you. We're told, have you not heard of the madman who lit a lamp in the bright morning and went to the marketplace crying ceaselessly, I seek God, I seek God. There were many among those standing there who didn't believe in God, so he made them laugh. Is God lost, one of them said? Has has, has he gone astray like a child, said another. Well, the man sprang into their midst and looked daggers at them. Where is God, he cried? I will tell you. We have killed him. You and I are the killers. But how have we done this? How could we swallow up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the horizon? What will we do as the earth is set loose from its sun? That was Frederick Nietzsche from 1889. And his point is that God, is, it's not that God doesn't exist, but God has become irrelevant. And men and women may assert that God exists or that he does not, but it makes little difference either way. God's not dead because he doesn't exist, but because we live, play, procreate, govern, and die as though he doesn't. And That is so true. For these Jewish religious leaders, God existed in their minds as as what they wanted to believe and not what was true. So they lived their lives in a way that showed that God does not exist. The tragedy, and you know, Art showed me a video um, last week about a, a Jewish rabbi who was telling why they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus because they don't think God can be that Jesus is God. And what's interesting is they don't even know their own scriptures, the Old Testament. Because Micah 5.2 talks about the Messiah being born in Bethlehem of Judea. And his goings forth are from everlasting, from beyond the vanishing point. That he is eternal, that he is almighty God. That's in their own scriptures. Isaiah also speaks of this, about the Savior being Yahweh, not a man, Yahweh, the God-man. Jesus said, I am. What does that mean? It means he's the voice from the burning bush. He's Almighty God. In fact, the whole Gospel of John, that's whole John's whole point. Again, If you look at what the whole Gospel of John is about, it's about Jesus being Almighty God. He said, I and the Father are one. Okay? And that's so important because they don't even believe their own scriptures. Now, here's the wonderful thing about our God. 
If we are seeking God, you know what happens? He reveals himself to us. And that's the wonderful thing. If you are truly seeking God, he's going to make himself known. He doesn't hide himself. That's not the idea. And here all these people are coming to hear John, right? They're in the wilderness. Think about it. I mean, imagine going to the middle of nowhere to hear someone teach. That's what they were doing. And it's not like they can get in their cars and drive and go see John. They, many of them just walked or they ride mules or camels. It was a long journey for them. And yet they were willing to do it. Why? Because they were seeking God. And they're repenting of their sins and John's baptizing them. That's the wonderful thing about our God. You know, in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we're told, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We all have an opportunity if we seek him. And I've titled our study this morning, it's really simple, John the Baptist Testimony, because that's what it's about. And I've broken it down into three main points. The Savior in John 1.29, the witness of baptism in John 1.30 through 33, and the evidence testifies in John 1.34. And those are in your bulletin, those breakdowns. So let's pick up John chapter 1, verse 29, as we look at our study this morning. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. You know, many read of what's spoken here and they feel that this took place immediately after Jesus' baptism. But that's not the case. And yeah, there's confusion. But when it says the next day John saw Jesus coming, it was after John baptized Jesus, after the 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. These are the events that are taking place here. Um, now, some may wonder, well, how can you be so sure about that? Well, the reason is simple. In Matthew chapter th- chapters 3 and 4, we're told of these two events. Matthew put it like this, starting in verse 16 of Matthew 3. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. So this had to take place before this. Jesus was already been baptized by John. Forty days in the wilderness he spent, and now we begin day one, and this is into day two, the second day. And we see this some four times in John chapters one and chapter two, the next day. We see it in verse 35, 43, and in John 2, one. So I think, again, this is after those 40 days in the wilderness, after John has his encounter now with these Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the next day, or day two. And what does John say as he sees Jesus coming? This is pretty amazing. Behold the Lamb of God who does what? Who takes away the sins of the world. We read that and we go, yeah, that's awesome. But understand in the Jewish mind, they couldn't understand that. They couldn't understand how the sins of the world, how their sins could be taken away from them. Now, I realize that there are many out there who think Jesus didn't come to die for our sins. Jesus is just a really good guy. He's a nice teacher, a really good teacher. He's the one we're supposed to live our lives after, but he's not Almighty God. He can't take away our sins. And we see that growing within the church today in direct opposition to what the scriptures say. An article from 2020 says, although most Christians believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and he is God, there are some groups that say otherwise. These groups argue that Christ is not God, rather merely a moral teacher. A recent poll shockingly reveals that many Christians do not believe Jesus was God at all. Very interesting topic, I guess, this morning. A majority of Americans and nearly a third of evangelicals say Jesus was a good teacher, 
but was not God, according to a new survey from Legionnaire Ministries that was conducted by Lifeway Research. They acknowledge that Jesus was a good teacher and a very moral one who paved the way for a revolution during the time where immorality was rampant, but that's it. Let us try to understand their views as well as try to understand the difference between merely a moral teacher as compared to the true nature of Jesus. For a person to be a moral teacher, he must have the following traits. Honesty, enthusiasm, uh, ambition, hard work, curiosity, a sense of responsibility. Jesus has all these qualities which makes him indeed a moral teacher. What is fascinating to me is that 33% of evangelical Christians, evangelical, believe that Jesus was a good teacher. You have to wonder, are they even saved, right? You think, well, that's a little harsh, Pastor Joe. But think about it. If you reject that Jesus is almighty God, you can't be saved. Not because I said it. Jesus said it. He said in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you, if you do not believe I am, and I know he is there, I am he, but that's in italics and it doesn't belong there. It's not there in the Greek. If you do not believe I am, you will die in your sins. That's a pretty heavy-duty statement by Jesus. He's saying, if you do not believe that I am Almighty God, you will die in your sins. Pretty straightforward. The voice from the burning bush in Genesis. Wow. The Living Bible puts John 8, 24 like this. That is why I said that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am the Messiah, the Son of God, you will die in your sins. Absolutely. Now, I I do disagree with what they say regarding Jesus being a good moral teacher in that article because if he's not Almighty God, he wasn't a good moral teacher. He wasn't honest. He was deceptive. But we see, like I said earlier, over and over in the Gospel of John, Jesus affirming who he is, Almighty God. In fact, isn't that how John opens up? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's pretty straightforward. John goes out with, he starts with a bang. This is it. you got to believe this. If you want to believe, this is what you need to believe. So either Jesus is the Son of God, Almighty God, who came to save us from our sin, or he is a horrible, unreliable teacher. Those are the only two options. C.S. Lewis makes this interesting point. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend. Absolutely. That's the point that John the Baptist makes here. And it's so important. Because, again, in the Jewish mind, there is no sacrifice that could ever take away your sins. It could temporarily cover them until you sinned again, but never take them away. And yet, John the Baptist is saying that's exactly what Jesus has come to do. In fact, one writer said he used the lamb as the symbol of sacrifice in general. Here, he says, is the reality of which all animal sacrifice was the symbol. It was all pointing to Jesus coming and taking away our sins. The sacrificial lamb, the one who's come to take away the sins. And it's interesting because John uses the singular, not sins, plural, but singular, sin. And I think the idea here is that the sins of humanity were kind of collected into one and placed upon Jesus. When he hung on the cross at Calvary, all the sins of the world were placed on him. I think that's the idea. And he's Come to take away the sins of the who? The righteous? No. Because there's none who are righteous. No, not one. He's come to take away the sins of the world, every single one of us. Now, again, we tend to make ourselves righteous, right? 
I mean, think about it. You're comparing yourself to someone to make yourself look good. Who do you compare yourself to? Someone who is worse than you. Because then you look good, right? You know, it'd be like me. My wife had a knee replacement. And I can honestly say I'm faster than her. Yeah, she just had a knee replacement. But is it a true statement? Of course it is. But it's ridiculous because she just had surgery. How could she be faster than me? God accepts perfection. So when we compare ourselves to someone, we compare ourselves to someone who is worse. I'm better than Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, I think he got saved, so I don't think, I think he's in heaven. So pick someone else who's worse, a mass murderer who isn't saved. I'm better than that person. Well, sure you are. But are you perfect? No. Jesus came to die for the imperfect, for you and me, for the sins of the world. Because apart from him, we're dead in our sins. But Jesus came to take them away. Wow. The word takes away in the Greek has the idea of taking something up and carrying it away to destroy it. Think about that. To destroy it. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.24, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Psalm 103.2, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I find that interesting because that's in the Old Testament, right? And I don't know in the Jewish mind what they thought about that. As far as the east from the west, he's cast their sins, their transgressions from them. How does that work? Because that's not the animal sacrifices. They could never do that. Isaiah 43, 25, again, Old Testament. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Wow. Think about that. You know, as Christians... Say, you know, when we go to heaven, go, Lord, I want to see my file of sins. I don't know why you would say that. Say, so, I'm sorry, I have no record. I have no record of your sins anymore. He doesn't remember them. They're cast as far as the east is from the west. The east and west never meet. Not the north and south, they do meet. You go up to the North Pole, you start continue down, you start going down, you're heading south. So north and south meet, east and west never. You go in east, you keep going east. Keep going east, they never meet. That's what our God has done. And he doesn't remember them. Who remembers them? We do. And sometimes we beat ourselves up, don't we? I'm just not good enough for God. I'll let you in on a little secret, and maybe this will ease the pain. None of us are good for God. Okay, that's why he died for us, right? But the, Satan loves to tell us, you're not good enough, you're not worthy. Of course we're not. If we were worthy, he would not have to die for our sins. And we let Satan beat us up. But what does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 6? He says, put on the helmet of what? Of salvation. What does that mean? Where does the enemy attack us? Our mind. You're not good enough. No, put on the helmet of salvation to protect those thoughts from getting in there from the devil and believe what God has said, that he loves you so much that he went to the cross of Calvary to die for your sins. Wow. That's what our God has done. The sinless one, God Almighty, became flesh and blood, dwelt on the cross of Calvary to pay in full the penalty for our sins. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. You see, our salvation is never, never, ever built upon good works or riches, money to buy your way in. It's upon the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection from the dead. Jesus didn't come to free me from this problem or that problem. He, set me, he came to set me free from the bondage of sin I was in. He's restored my fellowship with the Father by shedding his blood. 
The Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. And think about it. The people that were around John the Baptist were probably all Jewish, right? Think about them hearing this. It must have been an issue, at least in their minds. What is he talking about, take away the sins of the world? Because the Old Testament sacrifices only covered them for a time. In fact, Paul picked up on that in Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 15. He said, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having up, obtained eternal redemption. How long is your redemption for? Do you blow it? No, it's eternal. Well, when does it end? What, it, can I mess it up? No, it's eternal. It's everlasting. It never ends. He says, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without a spot unto God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator, that bridge builder of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of of the in eternal inheritance. How wonderful that is. All our sins were paid in full, cast as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. And again, there's no record of that. And again, for Jesus to do this, he had to be the perfect sacrifice. Remember, the animal sacrifices could not have a spot or blemish on them. The Jewish religious leaders, the priests, would reject them. And then they would sell them one of their animals that were perfect. When Jesus had no sin, Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Absolutely. That perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. Isaiah 53.6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Maybe that's what John the Baptist was thinking about when he saw Jesus coming. What Isaiah spoke of. And John's words are a powerful statement pointing to the destiny of Jesus. The shadow of the cross is seen as his ministry is beginning. It, one sentence is the essence of the Christian message. One writer said a few years ago while I was speaking on a speaking engagement in San Diego, I decided to visit the Timken Art Museum. I heard they had an El Greco painting of St. Peter holding the keys to the kingdom. I paid my money, walked into the museum, found the painting, and looked at the El Greco in admiration. Then I turned around. On the opposite wall was a small walnut-colored painting, very ancient, 1525. As I looked closely, I saw it was a lamb almost photographically rendered. Around the lamb's head, barely perceptible, was a halo. As I looked more intently, I saw that the lamb's legs were tied and the animal, shrouded by the dark background, was laying on a cross. The title was Agnes D, Latin for Lamb of God. I wanted to weep. I stood there and looked at the picture for a long time. It was not just the beauty that held me, but the theology of the atonement. John the Baptist's words kept running circles in my mind. Yes, behold the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. He set us free from our bondage of sin. He's our Savior, right? And I find it interesting that, you know, tragically the gentleman was here, questioned the deity of Jesus, but he didn't stick around to listen to the evidence. And I, it breaks my heart. I wonder how many people don't want to hear the truth because they all have, we all have our preconceived ideas, let's face it. But if our preconceived ideas are contrary to the word of God, guess who's wrong? It's not God, it's me, it's you. So please pray for him, that God would speak to his heart and draw him because I believe he's searching, otherwise he wouldn't have been here. Amen. Look at verse 30 here in John chapter one. 
This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remaining upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Again, think of all this attention that John the Baptist is getting. Look at the numbers of people that are traveling from Jerusalem all over Judea, the area around the Jordan River. Very popular, but he didn't let it go to his head. He said Jesus was preferred or ranked higher than he was. That's humility. You know, today humility is a badge worn with honor, right? A little sarcasm. But if you need to tell people that you're humble with a badge, that's not humility. Just think about it. It just makes sense, right? I hate to say it, but we don't need no stinking badges, right? <laughs> this is an article from John Cooper. He was the lead singer for Skillet or is the lead singer for Skillet, a Christian music group. And this is from 2020, so fairly recent. And he's talking about pastors who are like rock stars, and this is what he says. Pastors shouldn't be rock stars. Yea, I said it. A rock star promotes himself, builds his brand, and entertains people. It's his job. A pastor is supposed to lay his life down for his sheep. He serves, he protects, and he equips the saints for the work of ministry. So why does it seem like many of our celebrity pastors are obsessively self-promoting, building their own brands, and protecting themselves by never preaching or teaching anything that would put them in Twitter prison? Yes, it's sad and devastating to watch our leaders fall into sin, but when the foundation is built so poorly, it shouldn't be all that surprising. Many Christians have been saying this for years, and it's past time that I join them. I'm tired of celebrity pastors. Pastors aren't supposed to be cool. They're not supposed to be fashion trend centers. We're all called to decrease that Christ would increase both in our hearts and in our lives. His fame should be known, not ours. Celebrity pastors, get out of the way. You're hogging the spotlight by making yourself the story. Instead, you should be taking some hits on the front lines by stating clearly what God commands. Celebrity pastors seldom do this. Instead, most of what we hear is rhetorical uh, gobbledy gook, veiled mysticism and repackaged New Age movement, self-help promotional material disguised as the work of the Spirit. My pastor helped change my life in college. Really? Who? Exactly. He remains faceless, nameless, and will never get the adoration of the world because his desire was for Jesus to have all the glory. He taught me how to read and understand the Bible. He took my midnight phone calls. He instigated the necessary but uncomfortable conversations. He taught me the importance of sexual purity and even taught me how to paint a house and balance a checkbook. It almost sounds more like being a father, doesn't it? Working, serving, teaching your kids, and never expecting a thank you or a hand clap is what pastoring is all about. Pastors, I'm thankful for you. Many are serving faithfully, and you will be rewarded by God. But for the pastors who are receiving their reward on earth, I have a request for you. Please stop looking for adoration from the world. We don't need you to look awesome. We need you to be fearless and preach the gospel according to the unchanging, authoritative word of God. Stop finding clever ways to evade questions. You know the ones. God's commands about sexual morality, God's authority structure in the church and at home, God's righteousness that demands punishment of sin. Answer them, and answer them clear, clearly for heaven's sake. Please stop trying to find new ways to explain the perceived inconvenient truths of God's word. You ought to love what he loves and hate what he hates. This used to be a prerequisite for church leadership. Today, it is deemed radical and even bigoted. Playtime is over. The battle is raging, and the field is full of wimps and boys who have never picked up a sword because it just feels mean. We need generals and leaders who do not care about their brand, their look, their likes, or making allegiances with the world. In short, it's time to make pastors uncool again. Absolutely. You know, let's face it, we all want to be liked. I mean, it's just human nature. But you know what? I represent God, and I have to honor him. And if it hurts people's feelings, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. 
but this is just what God says. And I can negate that. I can make everyone feel good, and we go all leave here being happy, and we're back out into the world where there's a battle going on, and we're not even prepared for it. Could you imagine being, getting prepared for war? You're a soldier, and you're at the meetings, and instead of showing you how to load your gun and how to shoot, we're going to have some cotton candy, and we'll have some playtime. If you need a little time out to sit in a corner, you can, because I don't want to hurt your feelings. If you're feeling uncomfortable, oh, don't worry, because I'm not going to yell or be mad at you. Let's just all go and be happy. Is that how you want to prepare when you're going out to do battle? Absolutely not, not me. We come here to worship our God, to fellowship together, to hear his word and to prepare for the battle that's out there. We have to know the truths of God found in the word of God so we can tell the world about Jesus. We're to die to self, guys. He must increase, we must decrease. It's one of the most difficult things to be able to do, isn't it? But it's one of the things we need to do. Back in the 70s, 80s, or 80s and 90s probably, and onward, you know, psychology has come into the church, and it's all about me. And we have Christian self-help books. And it's so easy to see how wrong that is because of the first word, self. No, I need a God help book. And you know what? I have one for you. It is called the Bible. This is my God help book. God help me, I cry. And he does as I read his word, as I apply his word to my life. Do you see how wonderful that is? I don't need self-help. I've screwed up enough. I don't need to keep doing it. I need God to guide me, right? I'm sure you feel the same way. You know, there was a, uh, a great conductor, Arturo Toscanini, and he conducted Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And it was a wonderful performance, brilliant. And at the end, the audience went wild. I mean, they clapped and whistled, standing ovations. They went crazy. And Toscanini stood there, and he bowed and bowed and bowed. He acknowledged the orchestra who helped him. And when the, the ovation began to subside, Toscanini turned and looked intently at his musicians. And he was almost out of control as he whispered, gentlemen, gentlemen. And they all leaned forward to listen. And he whispered to them, he said, gentlemen, I am nothing. Well, I mean, this guy was a brilliant. He was a master at what he was doing. He had an enormous ego. And then he said, after that, he said, gentlemen, you are nothing. And they heard the same message before the rehearsal. And this is what he then said. But Beethoven is everything, everything, everything. That is what we need to be doing. Jesus is everything, everything, everything. I'm nothing. I could do nothing apart from him. It's only by what he has given me that I'm able to do the things that I can do. And as soon as I leave him out or negate him, I'm going to fall flat on my face. And it's only by his grace. It's not such a, because I'm such a great guy. It's because his grace that he's extended me gifts, extended you gifts to be used to honor him and bless him and minister to people. What a wonderful God we get, have. What a gracious God we have. Now, in John 1.30, he says that Jesus was before him. Well, we know John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus was, so how could that be? John is talking about Jesus being eternal, that he's almighty God. He was before him. He existed before him. He is the eternal God. And that's why John the Baptist was able to say, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. No man could do that. No animal sacrifice could do that. But only God could. And he knew that Jesus was the one. How? How did he know? It was the witness of baptism. In John 3, verses 16 and 17, remember what we were told. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Wow. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, God gave John a sign 
that this is the one. We're not really told anyone else saw this sign, only John. And it was to confirm in his heart that Jesus is the Messiah. So he's a reliable witness, right? Because he had confirming evidence from God. And John now takes all that he knows and all that he's seen, and he's given us this testimony, his witness of Jesus. He didn't know Jesus was the Messiah before this baptism. They were cousins. I don't know if they hung out together or what, but they were cousins. John says in John 131, I did not know him. Exactly. Verse 33, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize, God did, with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. They were cousins and he didn't know until Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and the Spirit of God descended upon him and he knew that is the one. That is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. It's the witness of the baptism. And then the conclusion that John comes to is verse 34. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The evidence testifies. He recognized Jesus as the Messiah. The Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. Now he's sharing that. And he speaks with authority, with confidence. Why? Because he has the, he saw what God the Father, or he heard what God the Father said, and he saw it in the life of Jesus. He's the Son of God. And Jesus, remember what he said to Philip? If you've seen the Father, you've seen, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Philip. Wow. Now, some have a controversy over Jesus being God because of what John said that he's the son of God. And they'll say, well, that phrase, son of God, that means he's a creator being. God the Father created him. He's a lesser God or he's not God at all, whatever. Cults use that all the time. But this title was a messianic title. Son of meant of the same nature, the character. To call someone son of God was to recognize the nature and character of God in that person. Trench wrote, in naming him the Son of God, the Baptist speaks with unclouded vision. He means nothing less than the full Christian doctrine that the man Jesus is also the eternal Son of the eternal Father, co-equal and co-eternal. Absolutely. Again, cults use this to deny the deity of Jesus Christ, and I find it very interesting. When you look at all the cults, what do they focus on? What do they try to deny about Jesus if they want to believe in Jesus? His deity. Mormonism, well, he's the you know, brother of Lucifer. Really? No, he's Almighty God. Lucifer is not. Big difference. The Jehovah Witnesses, he's a lesser God. No, he's not. He's Almighty God. I think that, again, that is so important for us to understand. As Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And as I said, you know, when John opened up this letter, he did so with the sole purpose of showing who Jesus is. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try to hide it. It's not like clouded. It's not that you have to understand Greek to understand what he's saying. It's very clear. In fact, like I said, in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, is the groundwork. He's laying down a foundation, and all that's built upon in the rest of the gospel comes from what John wrote in verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was, with, he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Think about that. Nothing was made apart from him. In the eternal state, think about that. When did time begin? Time began in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Time began. Otherwise, it's the eternal state. When we get to Revelation chapter 22 on Thursday evenings in about 22 years, now we, we will get there. I, I know we're taking our time, but we will get there. The, we come to the eternal state. God creates a new heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem for us to dwell in for eternity. And I'm sorry, I'm not that smart. My mind does not work that well. But when I think of 
eternity, I say, well, it's just a lot of time. No, it's no time at all. It's forever. I don't get it. How does that work without time? But how wonderful that we get to spend all that time with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're not going to be little fat cherubs sitting on clouds playing a harp. Sorry. I don't think they'll give me a musical instrument. I'm not sure that's going to be healed in me, my musical ability, but maybe. But boy, we'll get to spend time with Jesus forever. Wow. I, I love that about our Lord. The paradise that was lost in Genesis chapter 3 is the paradise gained in Revelation chapter 22. You see, in, I don't know if it's like this in your Bibles, but I have a couple pages where everything was very good. And the rest of it is very bad. <laughs> and God comes to correct that very bad problem in this world's sin. And that's what he does. That's the paradise lost in Genesis is the paradise gained in Revelation. Praise God for that. We long for that day. And it's coming. And so for us, it's our, about our testimony of Jesus. What are we telling the world about him? I'll share my little bit about my past, but I don't care all about my past. You know what I care about? My present salvation in Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs to hear. It's really easy. I was a sinner lost. I believed that creation was my, or evolution was my God. And then God touched my heart. And I could tell you stories about what he has done from that very beginning. All the way to making me a pastor. Because I didn't like talking in front of people. It was my biggest fear. In grade school, you kind of understand why I'm so weird. I had to sing, I think it was Singing in the Rain. Okay, my music the teacher, if she was still alive, she was in therapy to the end <laughs> because I could not clap and sing. I, could, I was horrible. And to speak in front of people, I didn't, I didn't take one uh, speaking class in college at all, not one, because it was terrifying. I had to speak in front of people. And short time after I get saved, the Lord goes, you're going to Wisconsin one day to be a pastor. My biggest fear. I hated reading books. I get saved, and you know what? I love reading books. I love reading the Bible. Writing studies out? Are you kidding me? You don't know how many red pens my English teacher had to buy for my papers. That's how bad it was. You could tell my English is not very great. God gives the grace, and he places you where he wants, and all you have to do is walk by faith. And then give the testimony about what he's done. I tell a lot of people what God has done, how he brought me up here, because it's a miracle. But it's him, not me. All I had to do was walk by faith. Johnny Cash, you probably all know him. In his autobiography, he tells the story of his older brother, Jack. He was only 14 when he died. And he worked at a high school uh, agricultural shop where he had a job cutting oak trees into fence posts. And the money he earned helped support his family, and they were struggling to survive. Uh, they were working in cotton fields of rural Kansas. And then this horrible, horrible accident occurred one day. A table saw severely cut Jack, and a few days later, he died from that. But sometime before his death, Jack had announced to his family and the community that he intended to be a preacher. And everyone agreed that he would make a fine preacher because of his strong Christian character. It was well known. And Johnny Cash looked up to his older brother, and Jack's example still influences him. And Cash writes this, he says, Jack isn't really gone anyway, any more than anyone is. For one thing, his influence on me is profound. When we were kids, he tried to turn me from the way of death to the way of life. 
to steer me toward the light. And since he died, his words and his example have been like signposts for me. The most important question in many of the conundrums and crises of my life has been, which is Jack's way? Which direction would he have taken? I haven't always gone that way, of course, but at least I've known where it was. Here's the thing for Johnny Cash. Yeah, his life was a little rocky, but I think he came to saving faith. And what influence are we leaving? What are people seeing in our lives? And our prayer should be that they see Jesus, the testimony that we're leaving. Do we have a witness of the evidence? We do, from Genesis to Revelation. Here is the evidence for us, guys. It's so unbelievable to think that a book written maybe over a 1,500-year period of time by some 30 different authors, kings, peasants, all kinds of people, three different continents, three different languages, all controversial subjects, and yet it's one unfolding love story of God's love for sinful man. If I gave you an assignment and said, okay, I want all of you to write about, let's say, I don't know, sports. Let's, let's pick a, the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers and all that's going on. And just write, I don't know, 66 chapters on it. We'll take the longest book, or one of the longest books in the Bible. And then I'll compare the notes. And let's see if everyone agrees on it. That would be impossible. Even if I told you to write one page, we wouldn't agree on it. And yet here is a book, 66 books, and they all have one unfolding story. They don't contradict. God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is what we need to let people know, guys. That we've come to know our Savior, Jesus Christ. That we have the witness of the Word and the Holy Spirit showing us more and more of Jesus. We have the evidence. Now we need to testify to what Christ has done in our hearts and our lives. And we need that testimony more today than ever before. This is not a time to hide our light. We see the wickedness, the immorality that's growing. We see, you know, a few weeks back, we had the critical race theory uh, conference in Two Rivers, and it, it was mind-blowing. Now, on the 25th, at the Presbyterian Church down the street, and I don't mind naming names, I will, Presbyterian Church down the street, they're having a rebuttal to that conference why critical race theory is good. This is a church. How is that representing Christ? Oh, and one of the funniest things, and I shouldn't say it's funny, but on their little sign they had, we're non-judgmental. But you're having a conference talking about how they were wrong coming against critical race theory. Aren't you being judgmental? Of course they are. When you move away from what God has said in his word, what you hold on to is so confusing because it's all over the place. No, we're not judgmental. Well, we're just judgmental against this. What you? you said you're not. You see how confusing that is? But God is not confusing. He is so clear. We're all sinners separated from God. Our sin has separated us from him. We need Jesus, and Jesus is the one who transforms our lives. He makes us into the men and women of God we need to be. And yes, the morality that we stand for, according to the word of God, is offensive to the world. I guess there's a, a, a shampoo commercial out there showing two women who have a son who is transgender, and they're going to dress him up as a girl. Well, I'm sorry. You know, I can't stop buying everything, but I will definitely never, ever buy your shampoo. And I, I don't want to offend anyone, but it's the same with Chick-fil-A. You stood up for the things of God. And then you came against the things of God by standing up for homosexuality. 
And I really wanted to go to Chick-fil-A out in Appleton. I did, because I've only had it once, and it was awesome. But I refused to go, because here's a Christian organization doing non-Christian things. We are to be a light. And again, I can't not support everything, because I wouldn't go anywhere. But I'm trying to be wise in what I do. And I'm going to stand up in love and speak the truth. That's all John the Baptist was doing. He was standing up. He was preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. And as I said last time, we are preparing the way for the coming of Jesus, aren't we? Absolutely. The rapture and well, then we got the seven-year tribulation, but then the kingdom age. So let's prepare the hearts of the people. Let's go share the testimony that God has given us and point people to Jesus, not to ourselves, but to the one who could save. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you. And we know that you are always in control. And for all that went on this morning, you knew it was going to happen. You knew the message that was going to be given and the opportunity to hear the truth. And I pray for all of us, Lord. Let's take these things to heart. Let's not be lackadaisical in our walk with you. It's time to awake out of sleep. It's time to stand up for what we believe in, and not in an obnoxious way, but to share the love of Christ with people, to stand up for the things of God. And Lord, may we shine brightly in this dark world. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.